of science and multiple partnerships with scientists, institutions, stakeholders, museums to examine the, uh, the um, social history philosophy of science. And uh, this project has been working for eight years doing all kinds of stuff that you've seen around uh, Halifax and across the country. You want to see some of the activities, including our last lecture series called Lives of Evidence. Check out the websites, including scientists.ca, and there's a whole mess of videos and papers and conference uh, proceedings, uh, all of which are extremely interesting. We're filming tonight's lecture, and it will be uploaded to last. It's not live streamed like most of our lectures, uh, but this one will be. On the Situated Science website. We are working in collaboration this evening with the Center for Comparative Genomics and Evolutionary Bioinformatics on uh, bringing drawn numbers up from America uh, to talk about creation uh, science and its important uh, origins in the Maritimes. Drawn numbers has origins in the Maritimes. He's from New Brunswick, and he might tell us a bit about that. Um, he uh, is uh, one of the premier historians of science in the world, um, and uh, if you've done any work on the relationship between science and religion, or even in the general history of science, you will have uh, seen the wrong numbers who is uh, Mr. Izzy. He had his uh, PhD uh, way back when at the University of California in Berkeley, and then after a very short uh, period where he was fired from Loma Linda University, is that right? Uh, he took up a, a very long-term uh, important position at the University of uh, uh, Wisconsin at Madison as, uh, as a resident historian of science and medicine, and eventually became the uh, Hilldale and William Coleman professor in uh, history of science and medicine. So he just retired this year? Last year. Last year, to get out of the committee work he tells me. Great idea. Um, uh, those that are working in history of science know uh, him as the uh, indefatigable editor of the premier journal in history of science, uh, the unfortunately named nowadays uh, ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's appropriate for your work, by the way. Um, but his other works are um, uh, um, Legion. Uh, he's worked on, uh, uh, with some of my colleagues, on Galileo to jail and other myths about science, science and Christianity in pulpit and pew. Uh, where did science and Christianity meet? These are just the books. I'm not talking about the Sicilian articles. Um, Darwinism comes to America. Uh, God and nature and his classic, which is a big, fat tome and poor people will have a copy of the book. He doesn't have a copy. They all buy a copy because the bookstore outside uh, is selling uh, wrong numbers uh, books, and uh, I hope you will buy some, and we will stick around uh, for our... They offering a steep discount? No. Oh. <laughs> I wouldn't buy it then. Do not buy an Amazon, by the way. I hope you have looked up their various business practices. Buy it from the Coloco Store of Kings, which is outside, and uh, if we get uh, Ron liquored up, we'll sign everyone. His magnum opus is uh, the creation of a big Latin text that was published in 1993. Is that right? And then uh, reissued in 2006. It's a definitive uh, history of creation. Uh, without further ado, uh, Ron Lambert. I guess I don't need. Thank you very much, Gordon. And Thank you, Ford Doolittle, for arranging uh, for my stop over here. Uh, we met by accident in Iowa City last winter and struck up a conversation, and he said, well, why don't you stop by here the next time you're on the east coast of, of Canada? As Gordon mentioned, uh, I have deep roots in the Maritimes. Uh, I began school uh, in Moncton, New Brunswick, 
Uh, I lasted for a year uh, before my family moved down uh, to the West Indies. My father was a, uh, a fundamentalist minister and uh, failed in trying to convert the people of the Maritimes to his particular sect. Much better success in the West Indies. Uh, so it's, it's really delightful for me uh, to be back, in a sense, home, and uh, to tell you about a person who is arguably the most influential person to come out of the Maritimes ever. Uh, but he's not celebrated. I think there are no monuments to him uh, in, in the Maritimes, and probably most people have never heard of him. His name is George McCready Price, and he has millions of followers around the world uh, today. So that's the story I'm going to focus on this evening. Uh, the man who was the chief, uh, I was going to say creator, but that wouldn't be good. The chief uh, architect, oh, thank you very much. Uh, the chief architect of what has come to be known as creation science or scientific uh, creationism. Uh, George Price was born in 1870 in rural New Brunswick, uh, and except for the loss of his father when he was a child, he seems to have had a fairly uneventful childhood. But then when he was in his early teens, his mother converted to a, a strange sect called the Seventh-day Adventist. And that had a huge influence, a determining influence on Price's later life and work. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists, I don't know if there's anybody here who knows anything about Seventh-day Adventists. They're often confused with Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or something else. Uh, but. Uh, they were created in the middle of the 19th century by a young woman prophetess named Ellen G. White, who at the age of 17 began going into trances and experiencing visions. And then these visions, uh, her, her guiding angel, Unfortunately, never gave it a name, but she became familiar with it. Uh, used to take her and show her events past, present, and, and future. And on one occasion when young Ellen White was concerned about the correct interpretation of the first chapters of Genesis in the Bible, uh, she was taken by her angel guide to witness the actual creation and was shown that it had occurred in six literal days of 24 hours each and that in another vision uh, that much of the face of the earth had been restructured during and shortly after Noah's flood. So by virtue of becoming a Seventh-day Adventist as a teenager, young Price was committed to this particular interpretation, was very much a minority interpretation among even evangelical Christians uh, during the late 19th and early uh, 20th centuries. Price never obtained a significant scientific education. Uh, as a young man, he went away to college in Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, to a school uh, established by John Harvey Kellogg, better known as the inventor of flake cereals and, uh, and peanut butter. 
And uh, he, he, uh, he himself didn't make a lot of money uh, of this, but uh, his brother did. So much money that he had enough left over to fund the library in the medical school, which I see as W.K. Kellogg Memorial Library. So uh, if you like the library, uh, you should eat a lot of flake cereal to thank him uh, for that. But when he was at Battle Creek College, Price, who uh, intended to be some kind of writer, took the classics course rather than any science courses, and then returned to the Maritimes. He had a hard time uh, finding himself. Uh, he thought he might be a preacher, uh, but he had a squeaky high-pitched voice that didn't go over well. Uh, he tried to be a teacher. Uh, he wasn't very successful at that. He, he had his best luck selling religious books door to door uh, in Prince Edward Island where he rode a bike over the rough roads. Uh, he also, uh, I'm not sure what, what promoted this, but uh, as a young man, he married a woman 12 years his senior and had a couple of children that he seems not to have had much of a connection with uh, throughout his latter part of his life. The turn of the century found Price teaching at a remote school in New Brunswick located in, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Tracadie, uh, New Brunswick, uh, so remote that the Canadian government, in its wisdom, had put the leprosarium there. Uh, so nobody else would, would catch leprosy. And about the only other educated person in that small community was the physician, Harvard-educated physician, uh, who was the superintendent. And so the two people, uh, Price, the school teacher, and doctor, the doctor in the leprosarium, uh, struck up a friendship. The, uh, the doctor was shocked to discover that the school teacher didn't believe in evolution. So being an employee of the Canadian government, uh, and being able to receive Canadian publications uh, free, uh, he started lending Price uh, the reports of the Canadian Geological Survey. Price might not have been very polished, but he was bright and a voracious reader. He consumed these documents and almost became an evolutionist. In one of the few autobiographical accounts of a struggle with the claims of evolution versus biblical Christianity, he tells in detail how on three separate occasions he almost succumbed to the lures of evolution but by reading the inspired words of Ellen White and engaging in intense sessions of prayer, he was able to resist. And he decided that he would devote the rest of his very long life, he lived into the 1960s, uh, responding to the claims of evolution and historical geology. In reading these government documents, he ran across two phenomena that he thought were just wrong. That geologists, in order to save their theory, of long geological ages, hundreds of millions of years, 
had invented two cockamamie explanations that were confounded by common sense. One was something called overthrusts or thrust faults. And Canada and parts of America were notable for one of the big ones in the world called the Lewis overthrust covering uh, thousands of square miles in Alberta and, and Montana. And you have a phenomenon there uh, where there had been a fracture in the surface of the earth at some remote time in antiquity, and then a huge swath of the landscape had come sliding over another part and over millennia, uh, much of it had eroded, leaving fairly old rock on top of fairly young rock. Now he said, this is absurd. Just to save their theory, the geologists are telling us that this major tectonic activity uh, took place when anybody with common sense could see that this had happened naturally. And the iconic image from this area is uh, a, a, not a tall mountain in Glacier National Park called Chief Mountain. Uh, some of you may have visited in that park and you have this, this old, this mountain formed of, of ancient rock sitting on much younger uh, rock. He said, why don't we just accept that this was deposited in that order during the time of Noah's flood? Less dramatic, but uh, probably equally convincing for him, was the phenomenon of deceptive conformities. I won't tell you any more about science after this, but deceptive conformities are where you have the strata lying conformably, that is, as if they had been deposited directly on the lower rock. But geologists said, well, no, huge amount of time elapsed uh, because the rock on top is much younger. So it, it, there had to have been a lapse of time before the, the younger rocks were, were deposited. And again, Price appealed to common sense and said, look, if they look conformable, even to the geologists, they must be conformable. They must have been, been deposited in quick succession. His conclusion from all this was that the geological column, so carefully constructed by geologists and paleontologists in the early 19th century, was nothing but a figment of the geologist's imagination. And that, in fact, the fossil record, the geological column, was topsy-turvy. That uh, in different places around the world, you would find so-called older rocks above younger rocks and other phenomena that had convinced him that uh, there was no regularity uh, to uh, the fossil record. He wrote a book while he was still in Tracadie, uh, announcing his conclusions uh, in a, a somewhat rough and timid way that would not characterize his later writings. He got a Seventh-day Adventist publisher to bring it out in 1902. It did not bring him either fame or wealth. In fact, he couldn't find employment. So he decided that he would take off to New York City 
and write for the hack papers, as he called them, uh, in, in this metropolis. He gets down there and he can't find work in New York City. His wife and children are back up in the Maritimes. He became deeply depressed. Uh, I believe quit attending church and gave up his belief in divine providence for a period and had decided to sell his watch and buy a gun and rid the world of another worthless human being, as, as he phrased it in, in a letter. Needless to say, when his wife heard about his dire straits, she panicked. She wrote the headquarters of the church in the outskirts of Washington, D.C., and begged them to find some kind of employment uh, for her husband, and it worked and they invited him down to Tacoma Park, Maryland to help build church headquarters, which were just moving from Michigan to, to the District of, of Columbia. So here was this author, published author, doing manual labor uh, construction at church headquarters getting absolutely no respect at all. A few years later, he moved out to Southern California where the Adventists were building a sanitarium at Loma Linda, a place I'm very fond of because they fired me uh, many decades later, as was mentioned. Uh, but uh, there, he was a handyman and was again, employed doing manual labor, but he kept working on his uh, critique of geology. And in 1906, he self-published what was a long pamphlet called Illogical Geology, in which he laid down as a geological law his conclusion that the fossils could be found in any order uh, whatsoever. And even though he was desperately poor, he offered $1,000 to anybody who could disprove uh, his claim. There was not a chance in the world anybody was gonna get that $1,000. Uh, he sent out hundreds of copies to prominent scientists uh, some of them actually engaged him in uh, debate uh, before giving up in frustration, realizing that uh, reasoning was not going to make any difference uh, in Price's uh, views. He remained uh, an obscure figure uh, until about 1917, he published a few books in, in uh, the interval, uh, when Fleming Ravel, uh, an evangelical publisher, Ravel happened to be Dwight L. Moody's brother-in-law and was a big time evangelical publisher. And he published one of Price's books called QED, and that brought Price to the attention of the broader evangelical community just on the eve of the anti-evolution controversy that broke out in the early 1920s in America, excuse me. I think that's straight from an iceberg. I um, within a very short period of time, Price was publishing in uh, a number of religious journals, Presbyterian, Catholic, uh, Methodist, whatever, and many in Seventh-day Adventist uh, journals, uh, promoting his ideas. Uh, undermining evolution. In fact, he became so prominent 
that in the mid-1920s, the journal Science, published by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the most prestigious journal uh, in the United States, declared him to be the principal scientific authority of the fundamentalists. And indeed, he had become that. Virtually every anti-evolutionist writer of the 1920s cited Price as an authority, a scientific authority, against uh, evolution. Not surprisingly, not a single one adopted his interpretation of Genesis. And I think that's partly, at least, because of his sectarian slash cultist uh, background. And here, let me just give you a brief background of uh, uh, conservative Christians and geology. Uh, to make a very long story short, uh, geologists constructed their column, their famous column that appears in every textbook down to the present, during the period from about 1810 to 1840. Many, most of them who were engaged in this were Christians, and several of the most prominent ones were actually Christian clergymen. They were not doing this, as critics would later claim, to undermine the Bible, but to help understand uh, the Bible. And the Christians, by and large, uh, readily accepted the evidence uh, from geology and paleontology and interpreted in one of two ways. One was to say that the days of Genesis were actually ages. And there was biblical warrant for this. The Bible says that a day in the eyes of the Lord is as a thousand years. So making this judgment didn't seem to be outrageous in terms of uh, orthodox biblical scholarship. And so if each day of Genesis represented millions of years, uh, not, a big, not a big problem. As long as the story of the creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden came at the end of those hundreds of millions uh, of years. So humans uh, continued to be young. Uh, another very popular interpretation, perhaps even more popular, uh, was something that came to be known as the gap theory. Now, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the Bible, but I'll remind you a little bit of it. Uh, the beginning of Genesis says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The author, probably Moses, uh, never said when the beginning was. So perhaps you could put the beginning at the very beginning. And then the author in the third and fourth verses comes to the Edenic creation associated with Adam and Eve. So given what geologists had found, these biblical exegetes inserted the entire geological column between the beginning and the Garden of Eden. And in that gap, the gap that Moses doesn't mention, uh, they, you could have as many creations and catastrophes and recreations as you needed to account uh, for the fossil record. In 1909, Oxford University Press uh, published an annotated version of the King James Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. Some of you may have, have seen that. And uh, Mr. Schofield was very helpful uh, in one of the notes 
The advantage of the reference Bible was that it had explanatory notes with it put down there that Moses was really endorsing the gap theory. That was what God was revealing. And so it took on scriptural authority for many people. Uh, fundamentalists and Pentecostals especially embraced the Schofield Reference Bible. And uh, Oxford estimates that they probably sold about 10 million uh, copies. Now, if you uh, take a look at the early Schofield Reference Bible, you'll see in the middle margin uh, the date 4004 BC. So some people say, oh, well, no, you know, it shows that creation took place in 4004 BC. But if you read carefully, that is the date assigned for the Edenic restoration, not for the beginning, which is undated. So you still get this to, to retain that iconic date from Usher, Bishop Usher, um, in, the, in the reading, but at the same time absorb all of the evidence uh, that the geologists uh, were, were turning up. As I've alluded to, in the early 1920s, for the first time, organized anti-evolutionism broke out. There had been pot shots throughout the latter part of the 19th and early 20th centuries, but nobody had taken the trouble to organize opposition. But in the years since 1859, the publication of The Origin of Species, many churches and schools had adopted evolution. And it was the success of evolution, of the teaching and preaching of evolution, that prompted conservative Christians to fight back. And they did so with enthusiasm. They began organizing anti-evolution societies. They began introducing laws into state legislatures. And in three states, uh, three states passed laws making it illegal to teach human evolution. One of those states, the first of the states that passed one of those laws was Tennessee in early 1925. And the fledgling American Civil Liberties Union in New York City uh, noticed in a newspaper that this had happened down in, in Tennessee and decided that they would oppose it. They had only been in existence a short time, uh, but uh, they thought this would be a great case uh, to take on. And so they put uh, notices in the Chattanooga and Memphis National Papers uh, looking for a guinea pig uh, who would offer uh, himself up as the uh, sacrificial lamb in this, in this case. Uh, you all know uh, about, well, no, maybe not in Canada you don't know, uh, about the Scopes trial in the summer of 1925 in which a uh, young high school science teacher, however, not a biology teacher, uh, was, quote, arrested for teaching human evolution. And a great film was released in 1959 and 1960 uh, called Inherit the Wind. It's a marvelous film. It's pathetic history but I still like to show it to my classes and then I spend an hour or two correcting everything that's, that's wrong in the movie. Uh, uh, Scopes was never arrested. He volunteered. Uh, he, he was never put in jail, as the uh, film depicts. And worst of all, 
he was never in love with the preacher's daughter. I mean, that's the whole heart of the movie, falling in love with the preacher's daughter, the preacher who was denouncing him to hell um, in this. And in one of the critical scenes that has stuck with just about everybody who's seen it, and unfortunately with historians who should know better, you have the agnostic defense attorney, Clarence Darrow from Chicago, facing off against William Jennings Bryan, a leader of the fundamentalist movement, and one of the most popular politicians in America who had run three times as the Democratic nominee for, for president. And was a fantastic orator. And Darrow, in what seems to be an unprecedented move, called Brian to the stand as an authority on the Bible. Now you, go, you don't get to call your opposing attorney as an expert witness, but Brian was so confident of his biblical knowledge that he, he told his other attorney, no, 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 let me do it. I want, you know, he thought God would, would help him uh, during this period. So uh, Brian goes, goes on the stand and um, in, in one of the great scenes in the movie, uh, Daryl asked him, well, when did creation take place? Well, 4004 BC. And he said, well, when? Uh, on October 23 uh, at 9 a.m. And Darrow says, uh, was that Eastern Standard Time or Mountain Time? And of course, you know, it's, it's funny. Except it doesn't come close to the truth. Remember I said that the leaders of the anti-evolution movement were willing to accept the antiquity of life on Earth. And the transcripts of the trial had been available in print since the end of 1925. So any historian worth his or her salt could have read this. When Darrow challenges Brian, Brian gets frustrated. I mean, clearly Darrow thought he was gonna to try to put everything in 6,000 years. Brian says, we don't care whether the creation week was six days, six years, six million years, or 600 million years. That's not at stake in our, in our debate. It was, of course, human evolution. But um, as the story goes, everybody in the courtroom was so shocked. Well, if they were knowledgeable at all, that wouldn't have surprised them. William Jennings Bryan had been endorsing the day-age interpretation of Genesis for as long as he had been talking uh, about creation uh, and evolution. On the eve of the Scopes trial, Bryan wrote to a number of people uh, engaged in anti-evolutionism, inviting them to come down uh, as, uh, as experts for him. Uh, he didn't do too well. Uh, he wrote a Catholic uh, journalist who had published a book called God or Gorilla, but the uh, uh, name was McCann, uh, wrote back and laid Brian out for trying to shut up the people. He was especially annoyed because Brian had big, been a big promoter of prohibition and he hated uh, that aspect. Um, a prominent, maybe one of the most prominent evangelical scientists was an obstetrician and gynecologist at Johns Hopkins, one of the big four, Dr. Howard Kelly. Uh, who sometimes called himself an, a fundamentalist. And so Brian wrote him and said, Dr. Kelly, uh, I'd like for you to come down to Dayton, Tennessee and assist 
uh, with the prosecution. And Dr. Keller, Kelly wrote back a very pleasant letter saying, well, Mr. Bryan, I really applaud the good work you've been doing, but I don't think I'd be an effective witness because I'm willing to accept organic evolution up to humans. Brian wrote back and said, Dr. Kelly, uh, I wouldn't like you to circulate this, but I agree with you. I think evolution is silly. I don't think the biologists have demonstrated what they've claimed, but I have no theological objections to uh, evolution before the appearance uh, of humans. I'm trying to, how long do I have? So, okay, I gotta tell you an anecdote. It's one of my favorite ones, but it's not about price really. Uh, uh, so, uh, as I say, Brian thought evolution was really pretty silly and used to go around the country giving a lecture, The Menace of Darwinism, uh, in which he, he would illustrate uh, the uh, failures of the evolutionists. And uh, one of his best lines was uh, to point out that these biologists, usually godless biologists, uh, said that a, an ancient animal developed a mole and then noticed that uh, over time it became sensitive to the light and would turn to maximize the amount of light because it felt really good. Uh, after a while, many, many, many years, millions of years perhaps, it became optically sensitive and turned into the vertebrate eye. And the punchline was, and can you believe that it happened not once but twice? <laughs> you know, and it is, and, you know, you, you gotta wonder about that uh, if you're worried, because the eye had been used as an example of divine design for so long. This was probably the, the paradigmatic uh, example that you would give. And uh, so that, that was Brian. Uh, twice in his cross-examination by Darrell, uh, excuse me, once, uh, Darrell asked Brian, he said, so are there any other authorities who would agree with you? And he said, yes, two, George Frederick Wright and George McCready Price. Well, George Frederick Wright had been dead for four years. Uh, they, might, they, might, they probably would have agreed on most things. Uh, Price had been invited but was in England and couldn't come as an expert witness uh, and had only advised Brian by all means, stay away from the scientific issues. In effect, you're not qualified to handle that. Later in, in some memoirs, uh, Price completely flipped and said that he had urged Brian to go and, and, and defend young earth creationism, which was faulty memory, let's say charitably. Um, at, at which time, during the trial, uh, Darrell says scoffingly, Price is nothing but a mountbank and a charlatan. You know, he's not a reputable scientist to, to, to cite. So Price's reputation wasn't, uh, wasn't improved so much during that period. Now, Price did offer an alternative to the prevailing views of the day age and gap. Drawing on the authority of Ellen White, he argued that the world, uh, that life on earth 
was only about six or 7,000 years old, and that the entire geological column had been deposited during the one year of Noah's flood. For Price, the primary evidence for evolution came from geology, which provided the time and the development that evolutionists used. And he used to say, uh, geology provides 90% of the evidence. And he probably devoted 90% of his writings to geology, uh, one book to biology, The Phantom of Evolution. Uh, so one of the amazing things was that although Price became extremely popular in the 1920s, not a single other writer, anti-evolutionist, accepted his young earth creationism until about 1929, and then it was a marginal non-Adventist. Adventists already believed this on the authority of Ellen White, and they were making jokes about him that, you know, here was this layman out there uh, fighting a war against who knows. Uh, so he got no respect except from fellow uh, anti-evolutionists. Uh, In 1954, uh, a sort of centrist evangelical theologian and philosopher named Bernard Ram wrote a book called The Scriptural View of Science. No. Christian View of Science and Scripture, excuse me. In which he argued that Price's interpretation of Genesis had come to form the backbone of fundamentalist opposition to evolution. And he termed this hyper-orthodoxy and really ridiculed it and urged evangelical Christians to return to the day, age, and gap theories or some other alternative that would allow them to accept as much of science as possible. Well, he exaggerated the influence of Price at that time. He also had a paradoxical effect. Instead of providing an epitaph for Price's views, he prompted a spirited response. Uh, a young uh, Princeton-educated biblical scholar at Grace Theological Seminary in Indiana was so irritated by this attack that he decided he would write his doctoral dissertation as a defense of Price and an attack on Ram. Uh, he finished the dissertation, uh, talked to some publishers, and they said, you don't have any scientific credentials. You need to, you need to buddy up with somebody uh, who knows the science. And after some checking around with various uh, people, he found one, a recently minted PhD from the University of Minnesota uh, named Henry Morris, uh, who had become a follower of Price's and had obtained his degree in hydraulic engineering, a PhD. So together, they, they wrote the book, The Genesis Flood which came out in, in 1961. Now, they both were defenders of Christ, but both of them were embarrassed by it. So at times, uh, John Whitcomb, the co-author, uh, graciously gave me access to all of his correspondence with Morris so I can kind of trace things week by week between the two of them. And on, on occasion, Morris would tell Whitcomb, you're just, you're following Price too closely and, and 
crediting him too much, people will make fun of us if all we're doing is, is recycling Price's views. And so Whitcomb would kind of relegate Price's influence to a footnote. And then Whitcomb would pay Morris back. Morris would be writing something and he said, Henry, we've got to tone down this, this, uh, this tribute to, to George McCready Price. And so Price slips a little bit into the background, although if you know anything about his views, they're front and center uh, in the book, and critics saw it uh, immediately when reviews started to appear. They sent a copy to the very ancient George McCready Price. Uh, he was in his 90s by this time. Uh, he was an irascible old guy. What seemed happy that somebody had taken up his cause. Three years, uh, two years after the publication of the Genesis Flood, which uh, created a sensation in evangelical circles, uh, a group of young earth, largely young earth creationists, uh, formed the Creation Research Society, dedicated not to anti-evolutionism, but to Pricean uh, flood geology. In about 1970, the advocates of this view decided uh, for political reasons that they would uh, rechristen this view, uh, do away with flood geology and call it creation science or scientific creationism. This interpretation of Genesis, which had been a tiny minority position among anti-evolutionists in the 1920s, almost entirely limited to the small Seventh-day Adventist community, became by the 1970s the very definition of creationism. If one said he or she were creationists in the middle 1970s, friend and foe alike, would have assumed that that person was a young earth creationist. And perhaps I should end right there and let you ask any questions you would like to. Thank you very much.